And we have that power that God himself uh, puts in us, that dwells in us. And it's, it's right here. It's not at our fingertips. It's actually on the inside of us. But here's what I discover over the years of ministry. Um, and that's a really broad brush I'm talking about there. That there's so many Christians that A, may abuse the power and believe it's something that it's not. B, there is some that struggle wondering if they have this power. And then other ones doesn't believe that they have this power at all. Or they don't use it. And folks, God gives us this power to live by in this world. There is no way that he's going to tell your flesh, and I'm, I include myself, there's no way that he's going to tell your flesh, hey, straighten up. Fly right. You remember all those things? Fly right. What's wrong with you? Stand up straight. What's wrong with you? Fly straight. Paul is not telling a stand up Christian and do the best you can in this life. I've heard people say this through the years of ministry. Oh, you say, well, you know, how, you know how's things going? They may be um, on the mountaintop. They may be in the valley, but they're believers. And I say, well, you know, how's things going in your life? And they say, well, you know, I'm doing the best I can. And I always give them this advice. Stop doing the best you can. They said, what are you talking about? I said, rely on God. Be dependent upon him every day in prayer, every day in his word, every day being the obedient to his word. The power is in us, and sometimes I've seen Christians that live, seems like their whole life, and just never get into this power. Now, let me tell you why. We have been talking um, in the book of John, we've been teaching the book of John for uh, quite, quite some time now, maybe a year or so. And we've just now made it to chapter 12, Jesus' entry. But we took some time this past Wednesday and we looked at the difference between being saved and being a disciple. Now, watch what I'm going to tell you. You say, what do you mean watch? Because fruit is not invisible. It, you don't eat invisible apples. But you're still going to be hungry, I promise you. Fruit is visible into the world. People can see you. They hear you. They, they even feel sometimes what you feel. And, and they look at you. And they try to judge and see what you're doing. It, it's it's, it's kind of like um, a natural ability that we have. Um, you know, I mean, we come out of the grocery store. And Laura say. Did you see that dress that woman had on? And I'll say, what woman? I didn't even pay attention. I was probably too mad over the price of groceries. Can I get an amen? <laughs> so anyway, the world watches us. Here's the difference. You say, well, I'm saved. I've got it made. <whistles> time for the rocking chair. huh? Well, I like that rocking chair from time to time. But I know this. If I am saved and I love the Lord, and I'm to love others as Christ loved me, I'm, I'm going to be a follower, and that's what a disciple is, a follower. And when I begin to follow Jesus and seek for him and search him, of course we've already found him if you're saved, but I'm saying this, the deep things of God, and you want to live, and you want to grow in, and you want to conform to, that's when that fruit becomes apparent. But we don't have to have no fruit at all if you don't want no fruit. What does the fruit do? Well, the fruit is a witness, but it also is, it gives you the ability to grow in the Lord. You see, there's people that are saved, and Jesus paid the whole price. We talked about this Wednesday. Jesus paid the price for you for being saved. But if you're going to be a follower, then it's going to cost you. Got to put up a lot of things, quit a lot of things, do a lot of things, pursue a lot of things, and it cost. You say, well, how does it cost? Because it trims off the fat. What do you mean? 
I can't be a part of the world. I'm getting rid of all that stuff that I'm not supposed to be involved in. I'm getting rid of all of those things. And my mind, my heart, and my soul is focused entirely upon Jesus. If you're going to do that, you're going to see this fruit. Why would God give you the Holy Spirit? You say, well, to have fruit. Well, what is the fruit for? To evangelize to the world. Because you're different. You're a new creation. You're a new creature in Christ. So when we read of this fruit, if, and I have been in these shoes, you say, well, I'm saved. I've got it made. I've got eternal life. Time to take it easy. I can relax. Well, that's, folks, that's the time that we are on the battlefield. That's the time we go to work. That's the time when we go forth across uh, the world as Christians. I'm, I'm talking about a worldwide, uh, this church included, but all Christians. It is a time that we get busy being the salt of the earth, the light of the world, bringing others to Jesus Christ. Amen? Uh, that, that's what we do as, as Christians. And as we get into the scripture today, these nine fruit, no, they're not fruits, it's fruit, because when you're saved, you have this ability for all nine fruit. You could be an apple if you want to. You could even be a fruitcake. You put it all together. Amen? Uh, you know, Jesus loves fruitcake, but he doesn't like spiritual nuts. Amen? There's a difference. And, boy, I tell you, it's, it's amazing what God can do in your life if you say, yes, Lord. I'm talking about after you're saved. Lord, let me be that follower of you. Uh, so we see in Colossians 1 and 10, it says that you might work, walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful. Now, if you're going to walk worthy of the Lord, he says being fruitful. You see, if you're fruitful, then you're walking worthy according to the Lord, not according to me. Uh, I, I'm with you. Uh, so being fruitful in every good work, 50% um, of the time, no, it says in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Now, how do we increase in the knowledge of God? Well, if you take uh, several Bible courses in college, and well, yeah, you're going to increase in, in, in some knowledge there, of course, but that's not really what he's talking about here. He's talking about knowledge meaning the ability to be able to walk fruitful in every good work that the Lord deems you are worthy. Ooh, you say, that's a heavy load. Yeah, we're just getting started, amen. Listen, if you ain't had no fruit for breakfast, we're fixing to have some for lunch, amen. All right, verse 22, looky here. We talked about love already. I'm not going to expound on this much further, but it's just kind of an odd break where we left off last time. But the fruit of the Spirit... Fruit of the Spirit is love. Now, this love is an alienated love. It's not a love of this world. If you love your wife, uh, that is awesome. But if you're a believer and you love your wife, that's totally different. If you love a ball team, that's not the love here. If you have a good friend that you just really love that good friend... That's phileo, that's, that's not this love. This is an agape love. This is a love that only comes from God. It doesn't come from preachers. It doesn't come from the church. It doesn't come from New York bestsellers. It doesn't come from a library. Uh, it, it, it doesn't. It doesn't come from any man uh, at all. No religious establishment or no educational learning center that you can go to that you will be able to love like this. You say, well, wow, is this a kind of a love that's out of this world? That's exactly correct, because it's not a love that's found in this world. Can't be learned or experienced uh, or experienced and learned. Either how you want to make the package, it, it just doesn't work, because it's not the love of the earth. It's the love of God. You say, what kind of love is this? You say, well, that's the agape love, and you, we've all heard of that term. But this is a selfless sacrificial love now we say this and we love to say this because I, I, I me too 
we say, well, you know what? God loves me unconditionally. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Right? Praise the Lord. Husbands, uh, now Jason got, he was wound up this morning. I put the microphone on. It was still sweaty where he was talking about husbands and wives. Amen? That was a joke, y'all. Y'all, y'all hear? That's a love that is totally different because you love her unconditionally. You love him unconditionally. You love unconditionally. You love your friend unconditionally. You love your friend. You say, my friend did me wrong. There's, who was that that went to Jesus and said, well, how many times do you think we should forgive him? He said, well, 70 times 7. He's just throwing a number out there. Because the seven is the, the magic formula, a lot in Scripture. So they was coming up, you know, should we seven times? They said, no, seven, 70 times seven. Just uh, some odd number. That's love. It is not based on circumstances or conditions. It's a selfless giving love. It's a love that reflects God's nature and not yours. So, getting back to loving others, we'll close here with the love part here. Listen, if you can, and we already said this verse, but this verse is one of the biggest verses that impacts my life as the Christian, and it's the most miserable verse that I just about can read in the Bible. Because I try, I really do, I try. You see me, I, I'm trying, I'm trying, I try. And then when I take me out of the way, I'm able to do this verse. This is just, it's just mind, listen to this, John chapter 13. A new commandment I give to you. Who's this speaking? Jesus. He says that you love one another as I have loved you. Boy. He says, that's how you love one another. Whoa, love is not an emotion. It's not a feeling. Love is an action. You say, well, how does that figure in with Jesus? Because Jesus went to the cross for you when no one else could and no one else would. <laughs> and on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. The love that poured out of Jesus is that same spirit that is in you. Oh, no, it ain't. Oh, yes, it is. By this, he says, shall all men know that you're one of my disciples. Now, wait a minute. I preach. I teach. I went to college. I try to help. I do the best I can. I, nope. I don't even cuss. I'm a good dad. That doesn't show the world anything. I've seen some terrific dads, terrific husbands, terrific wives. That was lost. What shows the world that you love like Jesus loved you? And you have this love, he says, he keeps continuing in this verse, that you have this love one for another. Who's he talking to? He's talking to Christians. You know why? Because if you're a non-Christian and non-believer, you don't have the ability to love like this. But as a believer, we do. Well, that's just the first fruit, and we covered some of that already. Now, the other ones are going to come more quickly because I want to, I want to wrap up the series because we're coming into our blessed homecoming um, uh, next Sunday. Joy. Uh, now, this is a, a, just a, the Bible describes it as chara. It's an inner deep gladness. It is not based upon circumstances. It, it, it's not something that you see or understand and so you're happy because your husband bought you a new car 
Oh, I'm so old. Wrong joy. Well, you know what? My, my son talked with me yesterday, and he said he's trying out for a, a new job, and he's been out on the shooting range. He said, Dad, I scored one of the highest scores of everyone, and he was so happy. I love you, son, but when it comes to this, that's the wrong happiness. Now, I'm not saying he did wrong. I'm just saying I'm describing circumstances. Circumstances does not, does not describe this joy that's in our heart. It's an inner deep gladness, and it's not happiness. Do you know why it's not happiness? Because you say, well, that might happen. So when you say happen, the extension of that is happiness. Will it happen? Well, I'm not sure if it will. It depends on, it's not happiness. It's joy. And this joy that you have, no one or no thing can take this out of your heart. No matter what circumstance, what storm comes your way, oh, you might be discouraged and disgruntled. You might feel that God has got you, your face pressed to the dirt. But you still have this joy within that no one can take from you because it's the joy from Him and not an earthly joy. Not an earthly circumstance, uh, joy. It, now listen to this in Acts 16. I've heard Jason teach on this. There was a multitude together that uh, rose up against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. This is in the book of Acts. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep, keep them safely. Who, having received such a charge thrust them into the inner prison. He did not want these uh, two boys to escape. Who am I talking about? Paul and Silas. And he even put uh, stocks on their feet. And boy, this, this prisoner, this guard wasn't, wasn't going to lose his life and put those two boys clear in the middle of the center of the prison. Oh, ho, ho. what was Paul and Silas doing at midnight? Somebody tell me. They were singing praises to God. What would I have been doing? I'd have been looking at my bumps and scrapes thinking, God no longer loved me. Look at me. Oh, woe is me. Now, what was the result of that? Could someone tell me? What happened with the jailer and his family? <laughs> well, there was a big earthquake. The prison doors flew open. The jailer already knows he's lost his life because these two boys has escaped. And they said, don't trouble yourself. We sat right in here. And he came out and he said, what must I do to be saved? This man saw these two boys joy in the inner prison, locked down, singing praises to God. And he wanted what they had. <laughs> that's the joy folks that's what we have within us you say oh, I never had that much joy oh yes you do all you got to do is tap into it get rid of that self and, and bring on Christ stronger and stronger serve him, serve him longer uh, serve him more faithfully not that you're not saved and that it's, we have to say Lord it is you not me and when you begin to really get white knuckled and say, Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. That's, that's it. Now watch. Love and joy. Uh-oh, number three. Irene. We say it today, Irene. Peace. Inner tranquility. Inner calmness. And inner harmony. In John, he says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives you. This is Jesus' peace, not, not the world. In Philippians, it says this, and the peace of God, it passes all understanding. Somebody's going to think you're the weirdest person on the planet when you have such peace inside and everything around you is falling apart. They're going to say, what's wrong with her? How can she have a smile on her face? Hmm. 
Charles Spurgeon writes this on peace. Now, this is several years ago. He says, I have seen the Christian man, mankind, in the depths of poverty when he lived from hand to mouth and scarcely knew where he would find the next meal, still with his mind unruffled, calm, and quiet. If he had been as the rich man, or if he had been as rich as an Indian prince, yet could he not have had less care? If he had been told that his bread should always come to his door and the stream which ran hard by should never dry. If he had been quite sure that the ravens would bring him bread and meat in the morning and again in the evening, he would have not been, have, he would not have been one whit more calm. And watch this. There's his neighbor, and Charles is, is visualizing, there's his neighbor on the other side of the street. He's not half as poor, but he's wearied from morning till night, bringing himself to the grave with anxiety. He doesn't even have the needs of this man. He's not in poverty. His neighbor is doing good in life, but life has beaten him in such a way that he's going into this great anxiety because he doesn't have Jesus inside. Joy, peace. Look at number four. Long suffering. <laughs> Boy, are you a patient person? Would you hurry up and tell me, please? <laughs> Some of you will get that later. Sometimes I'm not very patient. The ability to forbear or endure in difficult circumstances, long-tempered, the Bible says, not short-tempered, slow to anger, it says. Um, when a believer is wrong, they seek no retaliation. You wait till I get back home. You know, I'll, I'll fix that neighbor up. He thinks he's going to call me on the phone, whatever it may be. When a believer is insulted, he has no bitterness or no complaint that he holds within his heart. You see, that stuff can't penetrate because you're a patient person. What does it mean to be patient when you, someone may be doing you wrong? Because you understand true patience. You understand that they're human. And they make mistakes. And they have errors that they may do against you or someone or the workplace or even in the church. There, there are some here in the church uh, that sometimes are not very patient. And I'm talking about just in this church, but I'm talking about in church and worldwide. We have some very impatient Christians. We do. I, I, I've told you this little story before. When I had came up to a, a four-way stoplight, uh, I was the last one to come, and the other three cars was stopped. So I don't know if they have been sitting there meditating who was the next one to pull out or not. Well, on my right side there was two very elderly ladies in the car. And it was right after church, and I didn't know these ladies. Well, a man had come up, not paying attention, and ran into the back of these two ladies' car. And I was sitting right there, and I said, Oh, no, I'm never going to get home. I'm right in the middle. Now there's an accident scene. And I laughed really hard, and Lord, forgive me, but I did. These two women had just got out of church, still had their, when they got out of the car, they put their hats on. And they had that big, thick King James Version, the one that's got the big letters in it. And that man fell out of his car when he tried to get out. He was drunk, apparently. Something was wrong. And they wore him out with them King James Version, but hit my car. <laughs> they was waving everything they had, hats, pocketbooks, Bibles, beating that man. And I... I just, I couldn't help, they were okay, but laughing. So the man tried to get up, so when one of them saw he tried to get up, she went back and got another whack in and knocked him back down with her Bible. Not really too patient there. We're to be patient. Gentleness is number five. Uh, we see this as kindness, a gracious character, 
uh, generous. That's where we get uh, benevolence from. That's where we get that term from. We're, we're kind. And I love this church for all of these, but especially the kindness that's here in this church. You can't build a church and make people be kind. Many of you, most all of you that I know of, are just so kind. It, it, it's, it's amazing. Um, now, not all of us are patient. A lot of us has that peace, I see. But we are so gentle of a church that when sometimes an extended family from a family family, uh, if something happens in, in an act of benevolence, the church here, we reach out to them. Maybe a phone call, maybe a flower, some type of something in prayer. We're reaching out in, in, in an act of kindness to those around us. Folks, that's a kind church. That's a church that is gentle. And that's what Jesus says is part of our traits as a believer. It says, Be ye kind one to another in Ephesians 4, tender hearting, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Boy, there's another one of those verses. Is it not? You know, as a pastor, when I have, and I told someone this the other day, and they were laughing at me pretty hard. I said, um, you know, I like sometimes to get mad because it feels good because I'm never really mad. Like mad, I, you know, something happened, you know, flat tire on my car. Boy, I love to throw a fit once in a while and get mad at something, you know. And... <laughs> And they started laughing, and I said, then a calm and a peace comes over me and says, well, you shouldn't act like that. And they was laughing, and um, I said, oh, Lord, now I'm upset because, you know, I have the calmness in my heart. I was enjoying being mad. Just, anybody ever just enjoy being mad once in a while? Amen. Love your enemies and do good and lend. Help them, expecting nothing in return. And listen to this in Luke and your reward shall be great. We're, we walk, we, me, we walk around in this world just thinking that we're doing so many great things for God. You want to do great things for God? Love others as Jesus has loved you. Be a gentle, be a patient person. Have that peace that was within. And you know what? Not only love your enemies, but if they need your help, help them. And you shall receive great reward. Boy, doesn't that turn the world upside down. Hmm. Well, as we move on, number six, we see goodness. Uh, boy, here is uh, reaching out to others to bless others. Uh, a positive attitude. Here's the goodness. For we were sometimes in darkness in Ephesians, but now you are the light of the world. Walk as children of light. Uh, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Oh, thanks a whole lot. Just pile it right up on us. Amen. Uh, be a good person. Uh, you have so much in Christ Jesus that you're the richest people on the earth. Can I get an amen? You're the richest people on the earth. You haven't received it yet, but one day you'll get your inheritance. Hmm. Number seven, faith. Uh, pistis, faith. Trustworthiness, reliability, dependability. This is a faith that's produced in the life of the believer because of their willingness to be led by the Holy Spirit. This person allows others to see their word is their bond. You read stories long ago um, about business books and things, and I remember my uh, great-grandpa, um, he had went to the bank, and I had rode with him, and I remember something, he was doing something about his farm, and the bank was helping or doing something, I was too little, I can't remember, and uh, they shook hands, and he says, is there anything else I need? And the banker says, nope. He says, that's all I need was your handshake. He said, we'll take care of you. Wow. So this is talking about our trustworthiness, our reliability, our dependability. In 2 Peter it says, Whereby are given unto us an exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. This is it. We're to we are to live 
we are partakers. We have the divine nature within us that is the Holy Spirit. Well, as we're moving on, look, meekness. That is gentleness. Gentleness. Look at number nine. Boy, here's one. We could, this is a whole message, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go quick. Listen, temperance. What is that? Self-control. Anybody ever lose control? Oh, somebody has? I got, I got a taker on that, amen? I know I do. What's wrong with you? What are you doing? What, you know, losing control. The Bible says we're to be a temperate person. You can't really do this in the flesh because my flesh wants to battle. Uh, what does it really mean in a biblical sense in the Koine Greek temperance? Do you know what it really means? It means one of those little teenager phrases they used to say. Hey, man, get a grip. That's really what it means. Get a grip on yourself. And then in Proverbs, he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that rules his spirit than he that captures a city. Well, in verse 24, we talk about those that are Christ, that belong to Christ, have crucified the flesh. That's the passions and the inner desires we tell our flesh, no, we don't want that. We want to live by the fruit of the Spirit. This battle is a constant battle. When you fail, uh, pick, uh, put your shoes back on, and, uh, strap your boots on and keep going because it's a battle. You're going to win some, you're going to lose some. Now, you have the ultimate victory in Christ, but I'm talking about living in this world is hard. Can I get an amen? It's hard. It's difficult. It's not easy. But by the Holy Spirit, verse 25, it says, If we walk, if we walk, it means if we live. That's what the walking means there. Well, we come down to closing, and I want to read this from Second Peter. I'm not going to expound on it much as our time is about gone, but I want you to, I thought this, Peter, this in Second Peter, I thought it went very well uh, with where we're at here in Galatians. Listen to what Peter has to say. You say, well, why should I? Because... I mean, he was one of the most arrogant, loud-mouthed Baptist people in the Bible. Amen? He was, well, Lord, let's do this. He said, get behind me, Satan, the Lord would say. He said, Peter said, well, let's do this. Oh, no, Lord, I'll be with you. Oh, no, Lord, let's, Lord, 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 Peter. <laughs> and here we see Peter. Jesus is, is gone now. He's back to the Father. The church is really taking off by now. In chapter 2, where I'm going to read this from in Peter, uh, Nero has begun persecution. They're under heavy persecution. And here's what Peter writes in chapter 1. Just listen to this. Whereby, now remember what he's involved in here with the, the reign of Nero and these things. Whereby, are given unto us, who? Believers, exceeding great. It's not great that they exceed great and precious promises. Oh, he's remembering walking with Jesus. Oh, he is. He's remembering what every word that Jesus ever told him. He says that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. You see, the world is lustful. It's lustful. Everything is lustful in the world. He says in verse 5, And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge. And to knowledge temperance. Here's some of the fruit of the Spirit. Your self-control. And to temperance patience and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brother kindness, and to brother kindness, charity. Boy, how we are to love others and treat others. For he says, if these things be in you and abound, that means that you are letting uh, your fruit of the Spirit, that the Holy Spirit take charge of your life, and you're being led, you're walking in the Spirit, if these things abound in you, 
they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge. There's that knowledge word again, gaining that knowledge, that knowledge. When you're led by the Holy Spirit, you gain the knowledge in Christ Jesus. That's how it works. Well, verse 9, he says, But, there's the contrast, He that lacks these things is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that, his, that he was purged from his old sins. Let me stop right there for a moment, just real quick. When I had left the church years and years, oh, years and years ago, I had been saved for about a year. And I said, you know, I, I, I don't know about all of these things in the church. And, you know, I was wanting things in the church my way. And how's come the preacher won't do this? And, you know, just kind of fed up with the church. And, and it was a wonderful church, wonderful pastor. I was just wanting me and being me. And I said, well, you know, maybe I should take a break from church and this whole Jesus thing. And, and now I was saved, but I was being critical of the Lord, critical of his word, critical of his church. And then when I stepped back for a while and I got back into the flesh again, I looked back and I seen, oh, man, look what I have left behind. The precious promises of God. And I had forgotten, in a sense, that he was purged, or being purged from my old sins, what he did for me on the cross. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence, make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you shall never fall. You're talking about a man that fell every time he walked. Read Peter in the, in the Gospels, but now he knows. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You know what that means? When you live a life that is pleasing to the Father, oh, you're going, you're going into the kingdom. But when you live a life in that abundance that he has given you, and you are actually living and pursuing, conforming, you're following, searching, continuing in, in, your, in your Christian walk. He says, God's going to have the door swung open for you when you enter into the kingdom. You know what that means? Oh, that our rewards are going to be great. And just one little area we looked at this morning, one little area. It's a difficult area. Watch how the Lord is different. We've already said this, but listen to this. Love your enemies. Well, who wants to love their enemies in the first place? I hope you don't have any enemies. But if you do, love them. And if they need help, help them. Now, this is the mindset of Jesus. This is his character. But look what he did to all of those folks in the Gospels when he walked here on the earth, helping and assisting and doing not have any feelings and emotions for. But he helped these people that was his very enemies. Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. He's hanging on a cross. When we do the impossible that, that's in our nature, that's when the rewards come. Because without the love of Christ in me, I'm not loving my enemies um, sometimes I wouldn't love you. Sometimes I wouldn't love my own family. I wouldn't even love myself. Wouldn't love much of anything. But because of the love that is in me, I can love others, even if they're my enemies, and I will help my enemies if they need help. That's the love that's in us. And this is just one example. Many in the Scripture, and the Bible says, and great, exceeding great, is your reward. In heaven. You want to be rewarded in glory? Do those things that's outside of your natural ability. How do I do that? By allowing yourself to be led by the Holy Spirit of God. There's great power in God. Can I get an amen?